Hello everybody and welcome to episode 26 of my channel. Uh, this uh, episode focuses on Castiglione in 1796, which is uh, a 15mm uh, scale uh, war game using the DBN uh, war game rules. I uh, presented this game at Salute last weekend, so it's just Salute 50 uh, in April 2023. Over the last 18 months, I've uh, written uh, this book, Throwing Thunderbolts, A Wargamer's Guide to the War of the First Coalition. And you can see here the uh, on the left, uh, the, the cover mock-up that was, was used on Amazon and Helion's own website. Uh, but the actual cover is being, artwork is being drawn up as we speak. And uh, uh, will look more like the series pattern, which is I've shown a mock-up on the on the right there. I've just submitted the uh, manuscript for Throwing Thunderbolts and hopefully uh, uh, Helion will be uh, able to publish it this summer uh, 2023. So Castiglione took place on the 5th of August 1796 and it pitched Napoleon uh, as the relatively new commander of the French Army of Italy against the Austrian Verms who was leading the first of four attempts to relieve the siege of Mantua. And this uh, battle is one of 10 scenarios in my new book. So the, in the book, I give two options for refighting Castiglione uh, with DBN. Uh, you can play it at the full as written scale, um, which uh, gives a base of infantry as about 2,000 to 2,500 infantry or 1,000 to 1,250 cavalry or up to 18 guns. And this would give you uh, 29 bases plus the commanders with a figure scale of approximately one to 320 men. Uh, but this will be <coughs> fought on a three foot by two foot table. However, for salute, I chose uh, the other option, which is to use the half scale uh, for DBN. So in this case, the table size is six by four feet and each base is, represents half the number of infantry of the full scale. So 1,000 to 1,200 infantry, 500, 600 to 25 cavalry and nine guns. And this gives 52 bases plus the commanders and a figure scale of about one to 160 men. So when you see the photographs for this game at Salute, uh, the armies uh, were built up of uh, bases that, uh, that were 60 mil wide and uh, I used 15 mil figures as I've already said and the muskets uh, or line infantry bases are eight figures, light infantry six, light cavalry four and uh, the artillery bases are just one gun uh, with one or two crew. So it means on average the infantry base represents uh, two battalions. So, uh, taking the two armies in turn, the Austrians were commanded by Field Marshal uh, uh, Wurmser. He had 19,000 men uh, and 60 guns, and have represented that in the game by 12 bases of muskets, two of light infantry, three light cavalry, and six of foot artillery. On the other hand, the French, uh, commanded by Napoleon Bonaparte, who was a general of the division at the time, he had 27,000 men and 40 guns. Uh, the, these I represented with 13 bases of muskets, seven of light infantry, five of light cavalry, three foot artillery and one force artillery. Okay, so these are the rules we played with, the Belles and the Napoleonicis, uh, or, or uh, of the Napoleonic Wars in English. And... Uh, Although these game rules seem to have been around for a long time, uh, this version 2.1 was published in 2020, uh, so it's a fairly recent uh, publication. Uh, despite the fact this has been my first serious foray into DBN, I uh, couldn't resist uh, some tinkering for this scenario. In the national characteristics part of the rules, the uh, Austrian infantry musket range is reduced relative to the, the French and this reflects in the rules the, the view that the Austrian uh, uh, foot bases had less 
intrinsic skirmishers than the French uh, bases. Um, I actually didn't think that was appropriate to this scenario because the or while that was well that may be true, um, the uh, there was an imbalance in the number of battalion guns. The 20 guns extra that the, the Austrians had were the battalion guns that, that uh, went with each of their infantry units. And whereas the French battalions uh, were lacking horses and so most of their battalion guns were back in Nice and thereabouts. So only a quarter of the French uh, infantry will have had their battalion guns with them. So I thought the two effects balanced themselves out. So I left both sides with the same musket range. Uh, the second area of tinkering was within the victory conditions. As with rules in this series, uh, victory used to go, usually goes to the side that can eliminate a third of the uh, opponent's units, um, including their commanders and their baggage train in the count. Um, it, though, strictly speaking, the way that would work in this scenario would be 11 uh, French units destroyed versus eight. Austrian units. The the French only got to 11 because they're, um, they're, they're, they had an extra commander, which I didn't, you know, they had the advantage of numbers and commanders, so I didn't think that was particularly fair. So I, uh, I reduced it to the 10 and 8 we used on the day. Um, however, I, I I'm reading the rules more closely, the, the other option I had was to increase uh, both sides by two um, two bases uh, so that it would have been 13 and 10 and this is because the game is not a 12 point game it's uh, uh, it's a 24 point game overall I I looked at that um, and wasn't quite sure what the logic was is increasing it uh, to two I suppose I should have asked Alex um, uh, but I decided that it would end up in too much of an empty battlefield because uh, obviously those extra four units would come mainly from the the, uh, the fighting units rather than the commanders and the baggage train. So I decided not to implement that part of the rules. Uh, so I stuck with uh, 10 and 8. I am uh, a novice uh, with this uh, set of rules, so I'd be interested in the comments in, in people's views on that. So these are the commanders I represented in the game. Um, I, I didn't represent all of the um, column or division commanders um, uh, in, in trying to be consistent with the way the rules are set up. So for the Austrians, I didn't represent the Vedovich. Uh, instead, uh, Wormsa controlled the um, uh, right wing of the Austrian army. So Bodendorf uh, was represented, he controlled the uh, left wing of the army. Likewise for the French, uh, although Andre Messina uh, was was separately represented, I didn't represent Algarau and Kilmaine, they were covered by the uh, um, figure of Napoleon himself. Uh, the other commander, the extra commander that I referred to earlier, was the outflanking force from Mantua, uh, led by Fiorella in uh, uh, replacement of the sick Serurier. So in terms of the reinforcements that are included in the rules of the battle, there are uh, two bases that made up uh, Vadenfeld's command arrived late in the battle. So uh, this was on turn 20. Um, for the French, uh, I in tried to try and a rebalance uh, an unbalanced scenario. I introduced this uh, um, uh, device where Fiorella's division doesn't arrive uh, on the battlefield until the score of a d6 is less than or equal to the number of the turn. Uh, Salute didn't make any difference because they threw a one, so they were deployed straight away. So these were the victory conditions we used, as I've already discussed. Uh, the Austrians had to destroy 10 French units and the French destroy eight Austrian units uh, before the end of turn 24. Before showing you the game, I thought I'd show you where we are. This photograph uh, Daniel put on the internet, so I've stolen it. Uh, it shows uh, our table in the middle of a very busy hall. 
between the uh, uh, area, the new area that where they uh, had discussion panels and the Helion stand. Uh, so it was interesting and a and very lively place to be. This is the photograph of the setup. Uh, so you can see my Callistra terrain, which will now all be getting used to, uh, was came into good effect. And uh, that's uh, my eldest son, James, uh, who helps me with all of these uh, visits to shows um, uh, that I uh, take in support my work. And this is a closer view of the set setup uh, featuring my uh, new uh, cypress trees, uh, which are an essential part of any North Italian uh, uh, table. So let's look in more detail with the French who are on the further side of the table from this viewpoint. Here you can see Messina's division, which is quite a large one, massed uh, opposite the uh, right flank of the uh, Austrians. And uh, you can see it made up of a lot of light infantry, some musket line infantry and light cavalry. So on the other flank are Algarals uh, in the center and Kilmaine's uh, divisions. And you can see them here uh, lined up, uh, includes uh, in Kilmaine's uh, command, the uh, Marmont's horse artillery battery on the right. On the left of the uh, inset photograph, you can see a little uh, bobble of, uh, it's actually pipe cleaner on the infantry unit at the end and the uh, cavalry. And this indicates uh, under the rules, militia state status for poorer quality. Obviously the uh, French uh, light cavalry was uh, inferior in simple horse flesh to the uh, Austrian opponents. And on the right, you can see Napoleon uh, represented as the commander of the army. And on the other side of the battle, you have uh, Fiorella uh, leading uh, Sururier's uh, division, uh, infantry and light infantry plus artillery, uh, coming up from Mantua, uh, which was a bit of a surprise uh, for Wermser. And finally, in the far distance on this shot, you can see Despinoy's uh, brigade, just one base, uh, which was later coming up to the battlefield than Messina and uh, on his way to join him. So let's go through the Austrian setup and you can see them here closer to the camera, their main line, which was arranged between the Monte Mandela, Badano, uh, uh, Redoubt on the left and the uh, uh, Rocca di uh, Solferino Tower on the on the right. And this is a closer view of the Austrian setup. And on the left was uh, Sobotendorf's uh, command. Uh, the left of the Austrians was a bit in the air, as I like to say, and uh, this Redoubt, uh, uh, which had been built on uh, on this small, uh, very small hillock, and it's only five meters above the surrounding countryside, um, to secure it. So, uh, the village uh, column uh, made up the rest of the Austrian position, as you can see here. And uh, the there was on the high ground another redoubt, which doesn't get as uh, mentioned as much in. Uh, uh, in many accounts, but it's clearly shown on a uh, uh, contemporaneous uh, French plan of the battle. And here I've highlighted Weidenfeld's uh, uh, reinforcements, which are, are uh, still marching towards the battlefield and won't get there for uh, 20 moves. And finally, here's Wermse in the, the centre of the uh, Austrian line. Uh, in DBA, the, uh, at this scale, the commanders uh, have uh, command radiuses of uh, about a foot. And uh, um, finally, the uh, both sides had a baggage train, um, which I made up of uh, limbers, because uh, the limbers don't play a role in the game, uh, so I used them for the baggage train, uh, especially the Austrian ones, as I'd uh, 
painted them up um, uh, before I realized I didn't really need them. Just a few words about the figures. Um, these are ones are from my collection. I uh, use for the French a mixture of minifigs, uh, such as the ones on the right here, um, and uh, chariot miniatures from Magister Militum, uh, which are shown by the dragoons on the left and the more scruffy uh, French Republicans in the centre. So the Austrians are all from um, uh, chariot miniatures. Uh, they uh, uh, have an excellent range. In fact, it's a unique range uh, for this particular period um, with the casquette on the infantry rather than the uh, later helmet. And uh, I use them for all of the figures, uh, the exception being uh, two Jaeger figures, which are from Shobocky, uh, which I haven't included here, but they're very nice figures as well. <laughs> Finally, uh, the Austrian artillery, I had to do some head swaps. They, they are char chariot miniatures, but um, uh, the figures as they're supplied come with the later bicorn type uh, headgear, which is not, well, I say it's not appropriate to this period. It is a bit controversial, it has to be said. Um, but uh, the, the sources I've seen tend to suggest that, that at this time, uh, the Austrian artillery were in these uh, early forms of the Corsa Hut, uh, which uh, we see later on with the Jaegers. So uh, in order to um, uh, get them close, close to right, I... Uh, did hold, uh, head swaps with some Austrian Jaegers I had, and uh, that turned out to be easier um, than I thought, because uh, they're, they're just glued on, um, having filed flat the, the neck pieces. Uh, wouldn't like to drop them, uh, but uh, they worked well enough. Because the game took place at a show, I didn't do what I normally do, which is take photographs at the end of each move. Um, uh, I've taken photographs at key points through the game and uh, uh, so uh, hopefully you'll get the gist of what went on during the day nonetheless. So here we are at the end of move three. Um, the one of the other reasons for taking this approach is that the, um, the French uh, were very poor at their command uh, uh, or pip uh, roles and were quite slow off the mark. And here you can see Messina approaching the, uh, the end of the Austrian right. And also Fiorella was making his slow uh, approach march uh, towards the rear of the Austrian position. But the main action was the French attempts to outflank the redoubt on the Austrian uh, left flank and uh, taking on the uh, Uhlans uh, that were covering the, the redoubt and obviously seeing a Marmont's uh, uh, artillery come into action. Uh, ringed here you can see the little green um, uh, tokens that I use to uh, indicate damage in DBN. So each uh, each base can take three points of damage. The, uh, the first point really has no effect on them, like you see here. The second point uh, is, uh, represents a shaken unit, and the third point destroys the unit. So you'll see these scattered around the photographs. But again, uh, um, there were slow approaches uh, by Napoleon because uh, he didn't uh, throw too many uh, good pip dice. However, once the uh, French had moved within range, the Austrian artillery uh, was very effective concentrating their fire. And uh, by the end of move three, they destroyed their first uh, French base. So yeah, the uh, 17th Emirate de Leger became the first casualty of the game, giving uh, the Austrians their first victory point. By the start of move five, uh, the, uh, the Uhlans defending the um, the, the redoubt on the Austrian left had also been destroyed along with another French infantry unit to artillery fire. So the victory point score at this point was two to one to the Austrian. 
So at the end of move five, the Austrian artillery was being evacuated uh, from uh, the redoubt. Um, I uh, thought about this afterwards and wondered whether I should have decided that the Austrian artillery was fixed, but uh, uh, the game was already tilted against the Austrians. So I think it was probably reasonable to uh, allow this. Meanwhile, uh, on the French left, uh, the Austrian artillery opened up uh, on Messina's division, who was deploying uh, to face the threat to their flank offered by uh, firms of bringing forward his infantry um, to uh, attack the uh, French rather than just use a static defence. And this is a closer view of the action shown the Austrian artillery uh, uh, shooting up the uh, nearest French units and the ver relative, the, the, the respective light infantry coming to blows uh, on the extreme edge of the table. Meanwhile, Wermser uh, turned his, uh, his second line of infantry about and uh, had them advance towards uh, Fiorella's division, try and protect the Austrian rear. Uh, meanwhile, Fiorella deployed his uh, his units in uh, into a more battle arrangement, and uh, as they advanced forward, so we're now advanced towards move nine. And uh, James, uh, as the Austrian commander, chose a more aggressive approach uh, than Bermza did, who by this time would probably have started to withdraw, um, and. Uh, was attacking um, Algarau and Kilmaine's divisions as they tried to deploy beyond the uh, redoubt. Meanwhile, on the French left, uh, all hell's breaking out as uh, Wermser throws everything he's got at the Messina's division, including uh, light cavalry attacking the French light infantry and, uh, and the, line, the Austrian line infantry um, uh, exchanging uh, lethal blows with the uh, um, French infantry supported by the uh, Austrian artillery and you can see there two of the uh, French bases are already shaken. Meanwhile uh, Fiorella remorselessly marches on towards to face the uh, and attack uh, the uh, reserve line of the Austrian army. So by the end of move nine, you can see that the French attack has been quite bloody and the Austrians have uh, managed to destroy six of the, the French units, uh, but have also lost four of theirs. So that's about the halfway point towards uh, victory on both sides. So this shot shows an overview of the table at the end of move 11, uh, uh, during which things got pretty, uh, pretty tasty. On the French right, rather than retreat, uh, uh, James threw his remaining Austrian infantry on Kilmaine's division, trying to uh, destroy it. And if we look back at the overview and focus on uh, Fiorella's uh, division, here you can see Fiorella has now advanced into musket range, which is only two inches at this scale. Um, so uh, this is when the action can actually begin. Meanwhile, Messina is uh, continuing to fight with uh, uh, Wurms's uh, main uh, body of Davinovich's column. And you can see here that his divisions become a bit fragmented, um, and which makes manoeuvring it under the rules quite difficult, uh, particularly uh, given the number of shaken units it's got. Um, the Austrian artillery are continuing to uh, 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 make the French pay a heavy price. So at the end of uh, turn 11, it's uh, a very close game. Both sides need two victory points to win the game. Uh, the the uh, French have scored six points and the Austrians eight. So this is the table at the end of uh, move turn uh, 12 and uh, the decisive turn. So this is another view of the table allowing us to focus in on um, uh, on the action in more detail. 
And here you can see the elite French grenadiers have seen off their uh, Austrian attackers and uh, are uh, closing in on the remaining French, uh, Austrian artillery. Meanwhile, further east, uh, Fiorella's uh, columns have started to push back the uh, defending Austrians. Now you can see here that Fiorella's columns have had some success pushing Austrians back, but have taken a lot of hits in, uh, in response. To the north, uh, we've probably got to the point where uh, uh, Messina's assault on the uh, Austrian right can be seen to have been defeated really. Too many of uh, the units have been shaken or destroyed and, uh, um, and this is largely due to the aggressive uh, approach the Austrians took. So here we are at the end of uh, move 12 and the victory point tally has moved up quite a lot. The uh, Austrians uh, had destroyed eight of the French units, um, uh, needing two more for victory. But the French had managed to destroy nine of the Austrian units, giving them nine points. So the game ended in a French victory, uh, albeit a closer victory than the real thing. So time for some conclusions. Uh, I thought the game played pretty quickly and it was simple. And James had never played the rule set before and, uh, and it went quite well. The, the fact that the bases, individual bases represent brigades uh, is I think the key to understanding how this game works. Um, so there isn't the inter, there isn't much of the rock, paper, scissors you get with um, a battalion level uh, games uh, between uh, battalions and infantry battalions, cavalry regiments and artillery um, in the same way. But you have to see it as it's designed as a brigade uh, a base uh, or a division scale game. And uh, in that context, it worked quite well. So obviously the battalion gun differences I've already talked about and I may not have represented these correctly. The, uh, the other thing I could have done is uh, used uh, two more artillery uh, bases uh, on the Austrian side to represent the extra battalion guns. Um, I, I'm not sure, given that the Austrians already a lot of artillery units on the, on the table, that this would have looked right. And, uh, certainly doesn't reflect um, how the battalion guns were actually used. So I chose not to go that way, but I'll be interested in what other people who are more expert with the game uh, think I should have done. So obviously the game gave a, an almost an historical result. Um, and uh, Wurmser in this uh, game was a bit more aggressive than his uh, counterpart um, in history. Uh, who probably more rightly was concerned with trying to retain his army in, in one piece. And equally, it could have gone the other way. It, it, it wouldn't have taken too many die rolls to have gone against the French for the Austrians to emerge victorious. And the uh, French had poor CAP result, uh, roles uh, throughout the game, but particularly at the beginning. And I aggravated this by forgetting to add the plus one for good generals. Um, and this had <coughs> some impact, uh, particularly as Messina's command um, uh, uh, fragmented. It meant that Despinoy's uh, base just stood on the baseline, didn't get into the fight at all. As a footnote, those people who are experts on the battle will, will no notice that I put Grolet in the, in the wrong place. I put it on the wrong road. Uh, it should have been further north uh, behind Messina's division. Uh, but I'll have it correct for Partisan in a few weeks' time. Finally, I want to share some photographs that uh, have appeared on the internet by uh, our trusty chroniclers of uh, war game shows, uh, starting with these two from uh, Big Lee. And uh, again, they're nice shots show the game at different stages uh, to the ones I've shown. 
And this great shot from Henry Hyde shows you're truly in action, consulting the uh, one side uh, of uh, quick reference uh, notes uh, needed to run the game. And uh, again, it uh, shows a slightly different point in, in the game than perhaps some of my photographs. And Paint and Glue uh, took these photographs, uh, which uh, again are nice photographs. And I'm I, uh, particularly pleased that you focused on my uh, uh, Austrian limbers, uh, which uh, I was painting up until uh, late the night before to get ready for the game. And uh, which is why there are only two horses per uh, per limber. There'll be more, uh, hopefully. Uh, um, the the uh, I didn't do head swaps on these, but I needed to because as the the slide uh, showed earlier, they they uh, the furveys and uh, uh, wore um, brimmed caps, uh, for which I couldn't get appropriate figures. So I've gone with these slightly anachronistic figures from chariot miniatures. And the uh, Austrian numbers are a bugger to put together, so uh, it's good to see them get a feature. So if you've got this far through this video, thank you very much uh, for your attention. I hope you've enjoyed the video and it's given you a taste of what Salute was like as a games presenter. I've thoroughly enjoyed the day and love talking to the people who came to the table and expressed interest in it. So if you like this video and like those like it, I've got plenty more on my channel. So please like and subscribe in the normal way. And obviously look out for my book, Throwing Thunderbolts, A War Gamer's Guide to the War of the First Coalition, uh, which comes out in the summer this year. Thank you very much.